Good evening, everyone. This Shabbat, this past Shabbat, we read Parashat Balak. There's few subjects in a parasha uh, we have to focus on for every day's life in our days. And we can learn from, as you know, the Torah, its guidance for how to live. Even though it describes some history, but it gives us uh, information that we need to know how to live, what to do, what not to do, what's recommended, what's not recommended. We have a story of a non-Jewish prophet named Bilam. By the way, the first question who comes to mind, who's to say that the Gentiles should have a prophet? Prophet, it's only to the chosen people, the people who got the Torah, the people who has connection with Hashem. They are the ones who teach the world what to do. The Goim, they have seven laws to keep. Did they get a Torah? No. Hashem never gave them anything. No Torah. Whatever he gave to the Jews, a part of it applies to the Goyim. And the Jews spreads the Torah. It was translated to 70 different languages. And the whole world learned. And they learned from the Torah what they have to do. Why, in that case, the Gentiles need a prophet? If you say they need a prophet, why don't you give them a little mini book? The Jews have a thick book. Give the Goim a mini book, three, four chapters, speak about the seven laws, describe a little bit of their history or the creation of the world, something that they also have. It's not a contradiction. The Jews got the massive book, and they got a little tiny book that applies to them. The answer is the Torah is not just a book of instructions. The Torah, it's a gift. It's a precious gift. Before Hashem gave the Torah, he came to Moshe Rabbeinu and he said, prepare them, prepare them for this special day that I'm going to give them my gift. Before he gave us the Torah, he first gave us the Shabbat. And then he said to Moshe Rabbeinu, go and tell them that I'm about to give them my precious gift, most precious gift, called Shabbat. Matana yeshli bebet gnazai. I have a special gift in my treasure, in my treasury. I'm, I'm interested to give it to my children. Go and inform them, prepare them for the gift. So we see that it's besides that it's an obligation to live according to the rules, don't take it for granted. We see today, we see today, most of the people in the world have no idea about the laws of God. Even the believers, even the one who speaks to God in their own language on a daily basis, even the one who, in their mind, willing to give their life for God, if he would only ask, but have no idea about the laws, how many goyim in the world knows that they're not allowed to eat raw animal, to rip it apart and eat it? They may think it's disgusting, but they'll never think not to do it for religious per reasons, right? Chinese eat everything that moves. <laughs> while it's still moving. They eat, they don't care, dead, not dead. They take the cockroaches and the worms and all these things, you know, with the two little things here, and they fill it up in their mouth. They buy it on the street. Somebody comes with a bicycle and a barrel, and they take a big spoon, and it has a cup, and fill it up with all the worms and the cockroaches, and they eat them live. You see, in between their teeth. So what's the problem? If they're not disgusted by that, they're also not going to be disgusted by anything. The Japanese, the Chinese, and all the Orientals, they eat the brain of the monkey while the monkey is still alive. They tie his hand to the tree, they open up his scalp, and they take a spoon, and they sit and eat while the, dunk, the monkey becoming you know, more and more paralyzed until he dies. I don't kill him first. This is an example of Erev Ever Minachail. This is, by the way, this is a restriction of the seven laws of Noah. So they actually violate these rules. They have no idea. You come to Mr. Japanese from Tokyo, 
Someone explained to me that it's the barbarian, the primitive, not the civilized Japanese. Like in Tokyo, they won't do it. All the, 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 the big shots of the business, you know, all these companies, the electronics, Sony, the lawyers, the doctors, they're not going to eat. I don't know if it's true or not. One way or the other, the ones who eat, do they have any idea in their mind that they're violating the rules of God? Not even by a hint. Common sense. It's a common sense. Apparently, people have different common sense. What common sense for us, that is not common sense for them. Right? For instance, an Indian guy see you and me slaughtering a cow and making steaks from the meat of the cow, he go crazy. He asks himself, how can it be such a thing? How can they do such a disgusting thing to eat our God? <laughs> this, is, this is really an absurd, because if they had a little bit brain, these people, they say, if this is our God, or this is holy, how it's even possible to eat it? <laughs> Think about it. It's, it's, it's such a ridiculous joke. The certain things is hard to understand. Where is the logic of the people? But in their common sense, you eat a cow, you're a horrible human being. And we think if you eat a monkey, you're a horrible human being. You know? And if you eat worms when they're still alive and cockroaches, we, you're just disgusting. But they don't, apparently they don't think so. If it was something disgusting, they would hide. But they're not hiding. They do it in, a, in China in a market. They buy it and they eat it, just like that, in front of a camera. They show it to you on television all over the world. So apparently the question is why these Gentiles need a prophet? What is the prophet going to tell them? He's going to tell them that they have to keep the seven laws? That's much more simple. You give them a book and they will go by tradition, just like they have Christmas. <laughs> How do they know how to keep Christmas every December 25th? <laughs> they learned from last year. How do the people from last year learn? They learned from the year before. And the one from the year before, they, go. they learned from their father, from the grandfather, all the way to JC. Well, actually, JC never made it. It's 300 years after he died, if he ever lived. If there was a person like this named JC, nobody ever brought any proof to that. Stories, there are plenty. Pictures, there are even more than stories. <laughs> but ev evidence that he ever existed, no one ever gave. Don't let anyone fool you by telling you stories. No one ever met him in person. All the books of Christianity started between 70 to 300 years after he died. Nobody actually saw his face if he lived. That's uh, always that if. It's a major if if he ever lived, if there was ever a person like this. So, I mean, there's a lot of maybes over there and people willing to give their life for these things that there's not even, logically, there's not even 1% chance that it ever existed. If you really think about all the doubts, the more doubts, the lower the chance that it, ever, that it was ever real. There's many, many doubts. The story doesn't make sense. There's plenty of human errors. This contradiction between one book to another, telling different stories, that one is the opposite of the other. Very difficult to know what really happened if there was anything that happening. But it doesn't really matter right now. If you would give them a book, at the same time, more or less, when he gave the book to the Jews, he would make a second, not Mount Sinai, Mount Ahmed. <laughs> <laughs> and he called them, and they all come. And he showed them, listen, I gave the Jews uh, the, their book. Now I'm giving you your book. Everyone would be happy. Or maybe they'll be jealous that they only have a smaller book. Or maybe they'll be happier. The pen. Some people, even among us, the more they cut the religion, the happier they are. It's called in Hebrew Masorti. You know what Masorti means? Traditional. But there's also another trick here in the word. Masorti, if you break it to two words, Masor, T. Masor means a sword. T, it's the shape of a T in English. T. You know how a sword, you have a handle and then the sword, so it looks like a T. So it's Masor, it's a sword, shape of a T. Every day they cut another mitzvah until there's nothing else left. That's called Masor T. That's what they really mean when they say, when they ask a person, are you religious? Atada T? No, I need Masor T. Masor T means he keep nothing. 
He keeps the mezuzah, he keeps the mezuzah two, three times a day, that's called Masorti. Once in his life for the bar mitzvah, he put fill in for the pictures, you know, what is he going to put in the album? <laughs> Maybe the grandfather come from Morocco to Montreal to visit. So now for the grandfather, he puts a show for one week. He cleaned the dust from his tefillin. <laughs> Some kids, their grandparents, they're still in the old generation. So they look at them, ah, they're old fashioned, they have no idea what life is. In reality, the old people were much smarter than them. But the interesting thing is when the old uh, grandfather or grandmother asked the grandson, did you put fill in today? So he said, of course. And he's thinking, I, I put it in a closet. <laughs> That's really what it is. So the answer is, Hashem could have given them a book and done with them. That's it. Here is your instruction. Get, pass it to your children. It's an obligation. Finished. Why does he need to send them a profit? The answer to prevent a situation that in the big final judgment day, they will not have a claim against Hashem. What claim the Goim can have against Hashem? They would say the Jews had a shepherd. Shepherd moves the sheep in the right direction. Sheep without the shepherd, I don't have to tell you what happens to them. They get eaten, they go all over, they scatter everywhere. Within a week, none, none would be left. Shepherd is a leader. He, you know, he teaches them, he cleans, he does whatever necessary to maintain them. We didn't have a shepherd, we didn't have a leader. Why should we get judged? It's not fair. Where is the justice? It's one thing you chose the Jewish people to be your children, but that doesn't mean you don't love us. You created us in your image, and there are laws in a Jewish Torah not to steal from us, not to deceive us, not to kill us, which means we, we are important in your eyes, right? Because if not, you would treat us like a mosquito. You, you kill it or not, it's no big deal. Nobody brings you to justice for that. But obviously it's not the case. So it means we are not animals, we are higher than animals. You will care about us. And even in a Jewish Torah, it appears few times that you say to Moshe and to the Jewish nation not to attack certain nations. <coughs> and in the oral Torah, there are many things that you told the Jews that if we, if we, behave according to the laws that we are supposed to keep, we go to heaven, which is unique. You don't find it in any other religion that Jews would go to heaven unless if they join that cult. If they don't, they, they, according to them, there's no chance. And Jews are the only nation who say to the goyim, stay what you are, stay a goy, be a righteous goy, keep the laws, and you go to heaven. We're not after you to join, to, to join us, no. We're good as we are, very little, tiny, small nation. It's not a club. We're not looking for new members. We're not missionaries. The opposite. We want to make your life easy. Easy, surely, you express direction to heaven. Heaven in a limited way, but it's still heaven. How many Jews do not make it to heaven at all, ever? <laughs> If you, if you learn Torah, you know that the majority would not make it there. It's enough, you're not keeping Shabbat, you have no chance, even theoretical chance. Cannot be you broke the foundation of the whole Torah, and according to the Torah, if you break Shabbat, you're basically not a Jew, and you're going to go to heaven of the Jews. You cannot enter there. You just cannot go. Maybe get, re get another chance to be reincarnated, but there's a limit to how many times you can get reincarnated. It's a limit. You're not going to get reincarnated for eternity. There's one, two, five, ten, fifteen, each one according to what Hashem saw that it's necessary. Eventually, this world will be over. And with that, all re reincarnations will be over. And then everyone has to face what he cooked. He has to now eat. If it's delicious, it's delicious. You enjoy it forever. It's a special food you prepare. If it's delicious, you'll enjoy it for eternity. And if it's bitter, you suffer for eternity. No other way. So now going back to my question, why Hashem gave them a prophet? He gave them actually few. The most famous one is this Bilam, because it's mentioned in the Torah. 
The other ones you can read about them in a Tanakh or in a Talmud. But this one is specifically right here in the Torah. Why Hashem gave them a prophet? That they will have Ele Keneged Ele Bara Hashem. There's a rule. Those against those Hashem created. Good, bad. Black, white. Smart, foolish. Delicious, horrible. Be there, you know, mothers, not mothers. There's always two opposites. And Hashem gave the Jews a prophet, very holy, humble. The Torah described Moshe, the most humble person in the history. No one can come near him in being humble, in humility. It's an incredible human being. He came from being a shepherd and led the Jewish nation 40 years and spoke to Hashem, the only prophet who spoke to Hashem face to face without falling asleep. Everybody else, all the holy Jewish prophets, they did not reach his level. They needed to fall asleep and get their prophecy or to faint. Needless to say, the Gentiles. For sure, they had to sleep, as we can see right here in the parasha, when Balak sent his messengers to Bilam, he said, wait here, sleep here tonight. Let's see what God has to say to me. Why well, I have to go to sleep? I cannot answer you now. I'm not Moshe. Moshe comes to Hashem. Here he speaks, and Hashem answers him. But I'm not like this. I have to go to sleep. And not only him, all the other Jews, Shaya, Yermia, all the other prophets, they couldn't speak to Hashem anytime they want face to face. No. So now it's very interesting. Hashem gave them a leader. But who is their leader? Who is their leader? A person that make have relationship with his own donkey, which is a violation of the Gentiles. Their head, their prophet, that had all kinds of special abilities that we're going to specify soon. Such a horrible contradiction. You are the leader of bil maybe a billion people, maybe in those days there were hundreds of millions of people, maybe tens of millions of people. I don't know exactly the number in those days, 3,300 years ago. But one thing we do know, plenty of people were looking up to him. Obviously, from a different country, they invited him to give them services. And there was no Facebook, and no internet, and no YouTube. Which means he was famous in the world, thanks to who he was, without media. Today, every crazy person becomes famous after five minutes. <laughs> he jumped like a monkey. The whole world ran to buy his records. Today. The more monkey you are, the more money you make. The smarter you are, the less customers you have. Why? There's no customers for wisdom anymore. There's a lot of customers for drugs, lots of customers for stu stupid sport. There's lots of customers for all kinds of things, for cars, for jewelry. There's very, very few customers for real, pure, divine wisdom. Not that many. And the ones who finally come to buy the real precious merchandise of Hashem, they constantly being butchered and attacked, not only by the enemies of Israel, by Israel itself, by their own brothers and cousins, as I spoke last night in Bet Gabriel about the situation right now. So Hashem gave them a, a leader, a prophet, that they won't ever have a complaint. They had Moshe, we didn't have anyone. Yes, you had Bilam. But what's, what's the ability of this Bilam? There are a few arguments between the sages about up to how high his level arrived. Some of the Chachamim say there was nothing but a magician, a real good one. He can do black magic, Ouija craft, all these things that today you hear about, Kishufim. He's very good with that. But he doesn't have any real prophecy. Some say, no, he does have prophecy. But the prophecy doesn't come thanks to him. The rules to become a prophet means you have to be a holy person. You have to be a righteous person. Righteous, holy. You have to be a person that never gets angry. If you're very knowledgeable in Torah, but you what we call in Israel, krizioner. Krizioner. You know what krizioner means? Someone that has 
every once in a while an attack of anger. Every once in a while, sometimes it's every five seconds. You know? He gets up in the morning, his wife asks him, Moshe, what should I make for you, tea or coffee? I already want to kill her. <laughs> oh. First thing, I open up my mind, I, I have to see you, he screams. <laughs> no matter what you do, he gets angry. I had a guy like this in my neighborhood. You come to buy ice cream for him, you shake. You know? You shake. <laughs> Why? <laughs> if by mistake you give him one ice cream and then you change your mind and you want to replace it, which takes a second, and he started to wrap it with a newspaper, he went like this with the hand, one roll, that sentence. By the look he gives you. <laughs> I think I was the only kid in the neighborhood <laughs> that had the guts after he wrapped it and he was about to put it in the bag to say, hey, give it back. But I only had the guts once. <laughs> <laughs> Second time was already too scary. So, what's special about this Bilam? The Gemara in Masechet Brachot says, it says here, Yodea Da'at Elion. Yodea Da'at Elion, it's a very, very high compliment. Do you know what it means, Yodea Da'at Elion? Most students never reach a level that, that they know the da'at of the rabbi. Needless to say, the da'at of Hashem. Da'at is the highest level of wisdom. Uh, so that means not only that it's a very high w a level of wisdom, it's wisdom that is translated to positive actions. Intelligence and regular wisdom, it can stay in a head. It's like a, cir like a circle. It does not get materialized to any action. Therefore, it's almost worthless. It's good to know. It's impressive. But if it's never been translated to action, what's the point? This is what Hashem says, Hashem, Hashem shout to the wicked people and say to them, who gave you permission to tell my laws to the public when you yourself don't keep it? You teach about Shabbat and you violate Shabbat. You teach about you should watch your health and you smoke. You teach about the damage of the drugs to the brain while you yourself using drugs. It's very difficult. You give the ladies a lecture about modesty when you yourself are far away from being modest. The impact of your teaching, first of all, will be close to zero. But then you have another problem. Another problem is that who really nominated you to teach something when you yourself violated routinely? Now we're not talking, no one is an angel. Everyone violates rules here and there. Let's not make a mistake here. For X amount of time and then a person does tshuva, we can tolerate it. But like this all his life? Person that smoked 40 years, he can teach about quitting smoking? If once in a blue moon his desire kill him and he smoke a cigarette, it's not such a big contradiction. Especially if he hides, it's not Hilul Hashem, fine. But if he's in the class, just light a cigarette, uh, today we're going to learn the damage that the cigarettes makes to the lung. Uh, who's going to listen to him? Half of the people would leave the class, the next one will ask their money tomorrow. So it says like this, Yodea Adat Elion de Gemara said that there is one tiny second in a period of 24 hours per every day that there is a very, very strong Midat Adin in Shamaim. Translation, there is very, very strict judgment by Hashem for a very short period of time every day. There's a period of time. No one know to aim exactly to that second, but this Bilam got some kind of a gift from Hashem as part of nominating him to be the representative or the prophet of the Goyim. So he knows when exactly this judgment moment is, so he can make the curses in that second, and the curses can make, God forbid, the damage. Because usually, when a person kills someone else, the curses comes back to him and to his children. That's what the Gemara say. All the curses that King David cursed Yoav came back to him and his children. This is the Gemara. Gemara is objective. 
דגמרא דזנא תק ברייב. דגמרא את מאייר דוד המלך, very much. דגמרא פרוטקטד איז רפיטיישן, very much. When he did something wrong, same גמרא, criticized him. Even if a person deserves the curse, there is one, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that takes care of everything, the blessing, the curses. What is it your, what, what is our job to start cursing people? That's not the point. We're not talking um, the curses that you think today, that, you know, all these English curses. No, we're talking a real curse, meaning he's, he's doing a real, like what they call in English, like a real voodoo on him, like to put him to die or something like that. By the way, you should relax. Many people come to me with this question. I think my cousin made a kishuf on me. I think my mother-in-law made a kishuf on me. I think my partner made a kishuf on me. I think my ex-wife made a kishuf on me. I, I, since that, I mean, she put hair in my, in my, in my drink, and she did that, and, uh, and I found all kinds of things in my house. Ooh, wah. so many emails and phone calls and waste of time. I can relax you that since the holiness in the world went down 99% of what it used to be, same thing the Kishufim. They don't have the power that they used to have. Same thing Ainara, same thing Kishufim, same thing all this witchcraft, voodoo, all these things. Same thing demons. Demons have very strong power in their days until people did not leave Wednesday night and Friday night from fear from them or all kinds of things that they used to interfere with people's life. Today, how many people in the world can report that they had uh, something with a demon? The demons don't have the power. Actually, there's a question in Halakha. Reuven sold the house to Shimon. And uh, after he sold the house and he gave him the down payment, and now he has to bring the rest of the money, he found out that, the, that, Ru, that Reuven, the owner of the house, the previous owner, made some changes in the house. He broke some walls and he blocked windows. Now, according to Rabbi Yehuda Hasid, there was a very big Ashkenazi rabbi, Kabbalist, hundreds of years ago, seven, eight hundred years ago. He wrote a will. He had a will. He gave the will to his children. Certain symbolic things, certain spiritual things, not to do. Some of these things is not a law. It doesn't come from the Jewish law. Some kind of mystical thing. Some of them people found sources for. Some of them nobody knows where he got them from. And he left it to his children. And he said, there are certain things you should never do. Like, you know, if you want to marry a, a, a man, make sure his name is not like your, like the, like, 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 like your father. All kinds of things like that. But it's very symbolic and mystical. And there's, it created a very, very big debate and many arguments if this will was only to his own specific children or it was to the entire community or to the entire nation of Israel or was it only to his days or it's also applied to our days. There's about three or four doubts right here. Usually when you have two doubts, even if it was from the Torah, you can go to the lenient side. Over here, everybody understands that it's not in a Torah. It's the words of one holy rabbi. You cannot compare it with something that actually is written in a Torah. It's not in the same level. But at the same time, there are about three or four doubts about what he said. Did he mean for today? Probably not. Did he mean for the entire nation of Israel? Probably not. Did he mean for the entire people of his country? Probably not. Did he mean for the entire people of his city? Probably not. He meant, maybe, for his own children. However, you know, we are not foolish people. We always like to learn from other people's experience. If one holy person like this gives to his children such a will, why couldn't we do what he say if, if, if it's not going crazy? Why not? Why not to take it to consideration? One of the things he said, that if you block a window, the demons get very angry at you and they may hurt you in your house. So if you want to close a window, make sure that you leave at least one tiny hole that in a place where the demons used to come into the house in and out, that now they still have a place. They don't need a big hole. 
They can come from a tiny hole, but don't block it completely. So now Reuven sold the house to Shimon, and Shimon found out that now when he see this beautiful wall here, it used to be once a window. And he moved that wall and he blocked it. He extended the room while he broke the, 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 the wall that had a window in it. He broke it. When he built a new wall, he did not make a window. Or he moved the window to the roof or to somewhere else. He did not leave it where it used to be. So then, symbolically, it may affect the person. So now he wants his money back. And Ruben tells Shimon, come on, are you crazy? Find me one problem with the house, I'll give you back your money. That means I cheated you. Find termites. Find that the foundation of the house is sinking. Find a, a, a saw in, so under the ground, I don't know, all kinds of soil. It used to be a gas station here. Something that affects the life of the people who live here. Find asbestos inside the walls. Find, find leaks in the roof. Find something. Then the law requires either to give a big discount for the repair or to give back the money. But what, what, what did I what, You go by something that is not Torah. It's a will of one rabbi to his children. Go and prove that he meant for today to our days. So they asked this question to Rav Eliashiv Zatzal. And Rav Eliashiv said, that's not a damage. That's not cheating, that's not deceiving. Why? Even, even if this will was for the entire nation of Israel, which is even up to our days, everybody knows already that the power of those demons is really almost zero now. If they have any power, it's really, really, really weak. So even if it was true and applies to today, there's nothing to be worried about. It's like Dvarim, Chashashim, Chashash Be'alma. That's what he said, Chashash Be'alma. And there's also, there's also another way to solve the problem. Make a tiny, drill a hole. Drill a hole in a wall. Tiny hole like this. Put nice, something nice around it. That's it. What's going to be? You make a little hole and you solve the problem to cancel the selling of the house. This is just an example. Going back to our friend Bilam, so Bilam is living with his donkey. <laughs> You're laughing, you think, how can it be, right? Do you know how many millions of people in the world have relation with donkeys? It's very common by certain parts of the world that people live with animals. Nothing new. <laughs> Nothing new. Horrible, how to believe, how it's possible. A normal person that listens to it wants to vomit. But there are people who does it. And now, what do you think? Who's that? You're thinking to yourself, ah, it's probably low-life garbage people. No, no, no. It's people with suits and ties. It can be doctors. It can be lawyers. It's people that do all kinds of other things. When you, just, when you find out some of these crazy things that are happening in the world, don't jump to a conclusion that it's stupid people, or people with no intelligence, or people with no manners. You'll be very surprised. It could be a very big businessman, tycoon. Something mentally is not right in his head. He does things that nobody can believe. How can it be? And to be gay, it's normal? What's the difference? Just, just as bad. Just as bad. Why? Because it's against the law of nature. Once it's against the law of nature, it's crazy. What's the biggest achievement of these strange people? Achievement, you know, achievement. They think it's an achievement. This achievement will be given to them in the right time of their trial, and they'll understand that it was far away from being an achievement. But what supposedly is the biggest achievement? That in this generation, they are managing to convince the world that they are the normal, and the normal people are not normal. If you have a female, you're not normal, my friend. We are normal. We are the right thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Constant brainwash. And who helps them? The media. Why the media always help negative things? 
Why? That's the tool that Hashem gave to the Satan. How is the Satan going to convince the people to go against Hashem? They constantly brainwashed by the media, the newspapers. Look at all the children, who they imitate. What they see in the magazines. Yeah, they buy all these magazines. They see how these movie stars get dressed. The next day, everyone imitates them. I was in a Shabbaton in Englewood, this Shabbat. And there was one, one, one Baal Tshuva Jew over there. He owns a company that sells clothing to black people. <laughs> it's called uh, Dinosaurs. <laughs> he has this dinosaur logo. It's supposedly famous all over America. And his clients is 99.9% .9 black people and the white that imitates them, you know, with the, with the pants down, you know. So, okay, that's his customer. He was telling me some of the things that they have to do to promote the product. Uh, I don't even want to repeat it here, especially not in front of a camera. How, what they have to do in order to induce business that millions of people will buy the clothes, which wrapper they have to put on a deal, and what he has to do, and guns, and this, all kinds of strange things. In my life, I never believed that things like this exist. There is a world of lie, but there is a world not just of lies, but of a complete nonsense and illusion that exists out there. So let's move on. So Bilam lives with his donkey. He knows to aim when to curse, and he has only one eye, Stuma Ein. Really, the reality is that it's not so true. There's an argument if he really had one eye or not. Why? Because in order for you, according to the Torah, to have one eye, he has to say Stuma Ein, with Samech. Sa Satu means blocked. Stum ein means one eye is blocked. You cannot see. But shtum, with shin, is the opposite. That means not only has two eyes, the one eye is very, very strong with his evil eye. Very, very strong. He puts his eye on something and he makes ein ara. So strong that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to cover the nation of Israel to protect them from his ein ara, from his evil eye. When later he would say his blessings, he came to curse and he ended up blessed. Later when he started to say his blessings, we can see that he was very impressed by the nation of Israel. Why he was, why he was impressed? He saw that the tent, they have lines of tents. People live in tents in the desert. Tent, you have a tent, but you have an entrance to the tent. The entrance of this line is not facing the entrance of the other line, face to face. They are tilted to the right and they are to the left. Why? That you don't see what happens in the house of your friend. Modesty. So he was very impressed, this Gentile, he was very impressed about the modesty of the nation of Israel. And he specified it in his words. But then he said one more thing. First, let's see how it all started. Let me read to you a few words here. It's very interesting. It applies to today 100%. 100%. Vayar Balak ben Tzipor. Balak, he sees what the nation of Israel did to the Amorite. On the way out of Egypt, they defeated them, so they got nervous. So this nation, look what they did to Egypt. Look what they did to the Amorites. We are next. They started to shake. Vayagor Moab mipnei ha'am me'od. Moab, Balak is their king. They started to get very nervous. They're afraid of Israel. Kiravu, because it's very strong. Vayakots Moab mipnei b'nei Israel. They are very, very fearful from the nation of Israel. Vayomer Moab el zikne midyan. They come and they say, now this, these Jews will eat us alive like the ox is eating the weeds in the field, which is an expression, they're going to destroy us. Uvalak ben Tzipor melech lemoav ba'etai. And Balak, son of Tzipor, is a king to the Moab nation at that time. What's going on here? That's not the right way to talk. 
This is the way it should have been. וירא בלק בן ציפור את כל אשר, וירא בלק בן ציפור מלך מואב, right? את כל אשר עשה ישראל האמורי. And the king of Moab named Balak ben Tzipor, so what the Jews did to the, to the Amorite. First it say Balak ben Tzipor, not, not a word about him being a king. After they say that he got nervous and afraid and his nation is afraid and they're thinking the Jews is going to eat us alive, all of a sudden the Torah remember now to say that he was the king of Moab at that time. A whole verse for nothing, there's no extra word in the Torah. The answer is, when they saw that the Jews is on the way and they got scared, he wasn't the king yet. Because the Jews were on the way, they made him the king. Why? He was a very good politician. He knew how to talk. Many leaders, they came into power when there was time of pressure. He knew how to talk. He fooled the people. And the people look at him as the savior. The Savior, yes, we can, he said. <laughs> you know how to say, yes, we can. And right away, they ran to the Kalpi, and they vote for him. And he became the king. It's very interesting. He said to them, to his voters, I am the only one who can save you from them at this time. And they did accept it, and he became the king. Now he wants to hire Bilam the magician, to come and make a curse. Why? In a regular way, we lose. We have to find a mystical way to attack them. OK. So now he sends a group of important ministers to convince Bilam. And they show up. And this is what happened. He, they come to him. They say, we know Balak sends a message. We know that the one you bless is blessed. The one you curse is cursed. So we have a job for you. So they come, vayavou, veksamim beyadam. And they have magics in their hands. They do all kinds of magics in their hands. What do you need magic for? To impress a magician? If now you have Houdini, the number one magician in the world, whatever his name is. And I learned few magics. You know, Rafi, the magician, with the cards, whatever. He comes, he goes, and he comes to the biggest magician in the world. And he goes like this with the card. He said to him, get out of here. Why are you wasting my time? You're coming to impress me with this, with the rabbit, out of the thing. I can cut people to four pieces. <laughs> you know how they do it. The head is over here. The legs is over there. A whole grandiosic show. So I come. I show him some tricks with the cards. You get him? Yeah, what's going on here? They come with magics in their hand. What, what? Did you ever think about it? <laughs> Every word. Tools. Huh? Tools. Tools. What tools? He needs their tools? What tools they need? Huh? For him, for the They need to give him. He was already well known as an expert magician. <sighs> they came to test him. That's the secret. They came to see, listen, today, a lot of false advertisement, right? Someone claim he's a super duper. What's the first thing you do? You come to check him. My cousin told me the first time Rabbi Zion Abba Shaul, Zecher Tzadik Levracha, heard about the Baba Sali many years ago. He heard that there's an old man covered from head to toe, weigh 45 kilo, sitting, hardly has a beard, very, very skinny like this, drinking a little arak, all day like this with his glasses, sitting like this and hundreds of people standing online to come get blessing from him. There was no Baba epidemic like today. No Baba epidemic. The Babot learned from the Baba Sali. They saw that there was a real Baba, real holy, real tzaddik, real chacham, real modest, real humble, real exactly like the way a Jew should be in a very high level. And they saw how people standing all day online to just do something for the tzaddik. They saw that it's a very good business, but there's only one thing. When you go and buy a Gucci bag, they tell you $3,000. Then you go to Chinatown, you buy it for 15. <laughs> it looks from the outside the same. But once 
your girlfriend finds out that you got her from Chinatown, the, the, the engagement is over. <laughs> That's the real Baba and a fake one. Today, almost everyone is fake. All 99.999% are all fake. But he, some Chachamim say, Baba Sali was the last Baba. Baba means a holy figure. So Aben Zion Abba Shaul, he knew one rule. Nobody becomes holy un unless if he knows a lot of Torah. You don't become holy because you have a pink suit, <laughs> or your blorit is tons of gel, or you have two earrings, or you have hamsa necklace, Fatima hand. <laughs> comes from Islam. Uh, one person wrote to me, one Arab, wrote to me an email. <laughs> I become very popular by the Arab recently, you know. <laughs> I wonder how long how long I have to live <laughs> with all the the strong lectures recently about the Ishmael. But anyway, he wrote to me. He said the lecture was marvelous, but there's one mistake you made. What's the mistake? He said the the Hamsa come from Fatima hand which is the wife of Muhammad. Wrong, it's the daughter of Muhammad. <laughs> so I say thank you very much for the correction. Mustafa told me now that it's not the wife of Muhammad, it's the daughter of Muhammad. That's where it comes. So now the idea is, Rabbi, Rabbi Ben Zion Abba Shaul went to see if Baba Sali is a real Kabbalist. How do you go and check a rabbi if he's real or not? Kabbalist. It's a separate knowledge than Torah, Kabbalah. How do you check? There's two ways to check. One is you begin to ask him questions in Kabbalah, and then you see if he knows or not. But it's humiliating. It's embarrassing. Because if he is real, and he realizes that you came to test him, it's very, it's very embarrassing for you. You don't come to a doctor and say, listen, I want to know if you're really a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> what makes the Advil make the pain go away? Explain to me. Oh, you know, in the nerve, it comes in between the nerve. It isolates the nerve. Oh, so you see, he knows what it is. But after that, can you continue to be his patient after you tested him? You're embarrassed to show your face. So what's the idea? The idea is that he had to test him without the Baba Sali realizing. So you just follow how he eats. Because the real Kabbalists, they don't eat without Yehudim. Yehudi means every bite and every drink, sip that they take from the drink, they have the combinations of the names of Hashem. Like Yud, ten times. They go, like if you go to the Western Wall, five, six in the morning, in the sunrise, you go all the way inside the tunnel, you see the minyan of Rabbi Yaakov Ades. That is crying and screaming there every day for two hours when he prays. He's a very big Kabbalist. He even wrote about the Zohar books. So when he drinks from his bottle, he has a bottle over there, he doesn't drink regular. Like he wants to drink. So this is how he drinks. He takes the bottle a few times, then a few times. It's all combination, letters of holy names. So he, he followed how the Baba Sali behaved when he eats, when he drinks. He was eating very little. Also, he didn't eat meat all week. Some say he did not eat at all all week. He was fasting all week. That explains how he can be 90-something pound. 90-something pound? So he went and he said that he's real, 100%. He, he, not just a holy old man that people like to love. He really knows what he's doing, what he's saying. Anyway, so now they came to test him to see that they're, not, they're about to give him millions of dollars in gold and uh, some rubies. Let's not go wrong with him. Let's check if what the media of those days are explaining about this Bilam, if it's real or not. So Ksamim Bayadam to test. They come to test him. And then right after that, he said to them, sleep here tonight. I will answer you in the morning what God said to me. All of a sudden, he became the chief rabbi. Please <laughs> sleep here tonight, and I'll tell you in the morning what God said to me. What do you care about God? You want money, no? You, your wife is your donkey, and you care what God's going to say to you? <laughs> well, it's a part of the show. 
in Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in a grave, there was one Kabbalist for 18 years. Every day sits there, there's a huge line of naive, foolish Jews standing online to get a blessing from him, and he has a big jar, and they throw hundreds, fifties, twenties. The jar, every hour, gets filled. He picks it up, put it away, and it gets full again. After 18 years, they found out he's an Arab, <laughs> Muslim. So they came to him and say, ah, your name is not Rafi, your name is Rafik. You left the K out. Rafi, Rafik, sound the same. Now when we found out that you're not Rafi, you're Rafik, we have only one question to ask you. Why did you tell the Jews you have to keep Shabbat, you have to put filin, you must, you must be careful to eat kosher? So he said to them, what did you want me to tell them? Come to the mosque? They'll give me money? Go to the disco? They'll know I'm fake. So I had to tell them what makes impression. So I told them what the rabbi say, keep Shabbat, keep tefillin, and it was very good for business. <laughs> Same thing him. Sleep here, I want to see what God has to tell me. That's what he tells them. Now they're very impressed. Whoa, he has connection to God, very good. So, believe it or not, the plan worked. Hashem came to him. Now, I want to ask you a question. If we now fast from morning to night 40 years, 40 years, and we read Tehillim all day, and we go to the mikveh every hour, do you think by the end of the 48 years Hashem would come to us in the middle of the night and have a conversation with us or no? No. Probably not, no? Real conversation? Dear Yosef, don't snore too loud. <laughs> I have something to tell you. Well, I have a lot of people like this that they always see God and they, you know, they see schizophrenic, you know. <laughs> I want to warn you and the Jewish people from the end of the world is coming. God just told me the Messiah is on the way. Who is he? Mustafa from Egypt. <laughs> There's a lot of people like this. Not a joke. They really believe that they should see how convincing they are. So it says like this, Hashem came to him in a dream. Mia anashim imach. Who are these people with you? What is going on here? Ma Hashem doesn't know who these people are. He needs to ask him. What's going on here? The answer is, the answer to this question is the same answer to the question why Hashem came to Cain and asked him, where is your brother? Hashem already know he died. That's why he came. Why he came? How Hashem knew to come to Cain? Because he saw Evel is dead. So if you already know he's dead, why are you asking him? Why? There is something that when you speak to a criminal, he, once he comes out of his mouth what he did, that's completely different, and we, you confront him, and you are the one who specifies crime. It's not the same, even today in a police station. If they have all the evidence against you, you're on camera, there's witnesses, they already know everything about you, your DNA is there, they still do not leave you from the investigation room until you confess in your mouth that you did it. Even though, they tell you the whole thing, they show you the movie, and you go like this with your hand and all that. They still insist. So did you kill him? Only after you say yes, they close and they leave the room. Before that, they, you go like this, you begin to cry. Ah, how did I do such a thing? No, it's not a confession. Confession is, yes, I did. I did such and such. So Hashem comes to, to Kain, he asks him, where is your brother? So he said, am I his keeper? <laughs> he didn't know yet. What are you fooling Hashem? Why, why are you asking me? How am I supposed to know? As soon as Hashem told him what's going to be his punishment and what did he do, oh, ho, ho, he got very scared. He got the point. Same thing over here. Hashem asked him, who are these people? Right away, he puts him on the defense. So he said, he said to him, 
This is messenger from uh, Balak, the king of Moab. They want me to do a service for them to curse the nation of Israel. Maybe they won't be able to win the war against them. Hashem said to him, Lo telechimaim, don't go with them. And you will not curse the nation of Israel because it's a blessed nation. What made them blessed? I bless them. I bless them. How do you want to go against me? I bless them and you're going to curse them? Ki baruchu, it's a blessed nation. Vayakom bilam baboker, he woke up in the morning. Vayomer el sare balak, he said to the ministers of balak, go back to your country. Hashem refused to let me go with you. How do we know it really happened? Maybe he made it up. Because it's in the Torah. Hashem does not write lies in the Torah. If everything that I read to you so far, it's a testimony from God himself. That's why we know that God really spoke to him. That's why we know really he told him no, you should not go. That's how we know that, Balar, that Bilam told them go back to your country. So far we all know that because it's in our book, not stories. And they got up and they went back to Balak and said he refused to come with us. So he sent higher ministers more important people from the government. And they came to him and they say, we'll give you all the respect you can think of. We put red carpet for you. We'll bring all the media. We'll make sure it's all over. We put your flyers everywhere, big signs. We'll bring messenger to pick up your glima, your kilt, your dress. We'll bring you special horses. We'll give you a special crown. What else do you want? So he answered them, even if you give me your entire treasure, silver and gold, I cannot violate the word of God even a little bit. To do a little or a, or a big one, I cannot violate the rules of God. So far it sounds like Dolador, no? Okay. Sleep here also you tonight. And let's see what God will tell me in the middle of the night. So, and God came to Bilam again in a dream. And he said, if these people came to call you to go with them, get up and walk with them. But you only talk what I allow you to talk. And Bilam woke up in the morning. He took his wife. He put something on her back, the donkey, and he prepared it, <laughs> and he's ready to go. Okay. Now I want to ask you a question. There's a reason why I told you every word by word, the whole story. We, my son come to me, Abba, I want to go with you to this place. I say, no, you didn't behave nice today, you stay home. Five minutes later he come, Abba, please. OK, only this time you come. That's normal. That's people. Especially if the wife come and say, hey, have mercy on him. Take it. OK, no, you, you surrender. This is working by people. What's going on? You fool God like this? First time the other people came, he said to him in a dream, don't dare to go with them. Now another group came. He said to them, sleep here tonight, and let's see if God changed his mind or not. That's basically what he said. Otherwise, you already know the answer. What's the difference if Reuven came or Shimon came? What's the difference? The answer is the same answer. But he did not send them away right away. He told them to sleep here. Let's see what God said, which means he's dying to go. Very big job. I have... When I was in, last time I went to Los Angeles, I spoke in a big shul there in Beverly Hills, 3,000 seats there. Very big seat, very big shul. It used to be a church, and it turned into a shul. So when I spoke there, I met two brothers, two young Israeli Persian brothers. Apparently, when I begin to talk to them, I see. The one I mainly spoke to, the other one was just standing and 
saying a few words, but the main conversation was with one of them. I just discovered in the first minute of the conversation that he's a very famous DJ in California, mainly in LA, of the community. He does weddings, bar mitzvah, parties, holidays, Hanukkah, Purim, DJ. Right away, my ears came out, the radar, and I went full force with him, back and forth. And right away, I saw that this guy is an honest human being. He's right now making a horrible scene, making thousands make scenes in his parties, but he said to me all the excuses he could find to convince me that he does a mitzvah and not a scene. Why? Because if he would not be the DJ, they'll invite someone that is not close to religion. At least he's started to keep mitzvot. So he does everything he can to minimize the damage. Now when he learns more and more Torah, so he can put some of these parties not to be as bad. For instance, he invites in his list Jewish guys and Jewish girls. So all the people in the party are Jews. So if they finally go together, maybe they get married. But other DJ will invite 50 Christines, 30 Jennifers, uh, you know, uh, uh, 25 Sylvias, and the whole place will be, you know, a mix of everything. So you have Itzik, you have uh, Avi, you have uh, Mahadi, you have Muhammad, you have everyone over there, Mr. Leaf, you know, Korean, Chinese, these, Dutch, Germans, everyone together in this party is going to be worse. Very convincing, no? Oh, we go back and forth, back and forth. And after all that, Baruch Hashem now is in yeshiva in Monsi. Baruch Hashem. Came to the yeshiva and he quit being a DJ. Yesterday when I spoke here in Bet Gavriel, another guy from LA came. <laughs> I asked him, do you know the DJ? When I said, you know the DJ, it's just like Balak heard the name Bilam. <laughs> oh, you know him? Oh, he's number one. His parties. Why well, am I telling you the story? Same thing with, B with Bilam. That's the human nature. Bilam is dying to go, but he has a problem. Hashem told him, don't go. Not the rabbi, Hashem. The rabbi, ah, he didn't understand the rabbi, he said to his wife. That's not what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> when Hashem tell you don't go, there's a limit. So he, he was doing everything. So one time, before he came to the yeshiva, I was on my way to MTJ yeshiva to speak in uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein's yeshiva, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, in Lower East Side. I was looking to park the car. You know, it's Manhattan. It's not easy there. So I'm under pressure because, you know, you cannot be late. Yeshiva, they have on a tight schedule. It's not, uh, you can come 10 minutes later. No, nobody cares so much. But this is now, you have... X amount from this class to this class. So, and he called. What with the modern Orthodox guy that he already signed the contract with him to make a bombastic party for his wedding? Kosher. Kosher? <laughs> Kosher like the ones in Chinatown. <laughs> So I told him, you cannot make that party. He said, Rabbi, it's a lot of money, and I promise you it's the last one I ever do. I said to him, I'm not Hashem. I, Hashem doesn't put me in a committee to express my opinions. My job is to tell you what's allowed, what's not allowed. And I have to put away my heart. My heart tells me, let him do this party and bring him to the yeshiva, and that's it. That's my heart. What my brain tells me, my brain says, stick to the text. No permission to make any scene. That later it would be better, no. Right now you can do the scene, no. You cannot do end of story. So he said to me, the guy will sue me. I'm going to get into tons of problems. It's going to ruin my name in all community. It took me years to build. Ah, he brings compelling amount of convincing claims. Nothing. A few minutes later, he put the guy on the phone. The guy say, what all of a sudden changed? We made this plan months ago. I said to him months ago, he did not know me yet. <laughs> now he knows me. He realized he cannot be a DJ. 
He said, but it's not his problem. If any, it's my problem. It's my wedding. And I said, no, 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 my friend. He said, but if I won't go with him, I will still make the party and get a different DJ. I said, OK, that will be the new DJ's problem. He is my student. I have to protect him. All the million scenes that will happen in your wedding will all go to his account. For what? For two, three thousand dollars that you're going to give him? Very foolish decision. It cannot be. You cannot do it. So I started to say to this mother, I said to him, listen, I don't understand. You, are, you call yourself an Orthodox Jew. You don't know you're not allowed to make mixed parties? Well, you know, there's different opinions. I said to him, there's no different opinions. There's only one opinion, Elohim Sonezima. Guys and girls on a party with music, running, moving, dancing, as millions of scenes. What other opinion you have? Even the Hamas murderers knows it. <laughs> we continue to talk. Believe me, from the old way from Monsi to Manhattan, the call took. First time he called by himself. A few minutes later, the other guy on the phone. The entire time, I, I remember every mile I was going in FDR drive, and, he, and, the, and the phone got disconnected, and I called again. The entire ride. And in the end, the guy said, didn't give up. So he hinted that he's going to sue him big time. So after we hung the phone, he was very nervous. Wow, what am I going to do now? It's going to sue me. I signed the contract. I told him he won't sue you. And if he will, it's worth it to pay the price to be a servant of Hashem. Well, finally, opportunity to show Hashem, you know what? I'll, I lose the thousand knowing I did the right thing. Not in this level yet. So we talk, we talk, we talk. Then I said to him, don't worry, he won't sue you. I say, if he will sue you, you will take him to Bed Din, and I will come to the Bed Din. And I'm a witness to this conversation. He won't be able to show his face on the street ever again. He won't be able to come to any shul. They won't be able to put his children in yeshivot. He's a moser. You take another Jew to a non-Jewish court, you finished. That's it. You're gone. You're zero. You're nothing. You cannot be a part of the minyan. If you're on a shul, no one is allowed to come pray by you. No one is allowed to talk to you. No one is allowed to marry you. No one is allowed to come to your wedding. It's din moser. You're completely on a ban. Orthodox, modern Orthodox, reform, who cares? We're going to go full force. But don't worry about it. I was trying to make him stronger. I already knew that the guy would give up, eventually find another DJ. And Baruch Hashem, that was his test. He passed the test. And Hashem gave him the opportunity to come to the yeshiva. And now Baruch Hashem is already a month and a half in the yeshiva learning. This is the same thing here, Bilam. Hashem already told you you're not allowed to go. Now there's another opportunity. You call the rabbi again. Same thing like this guy. Oh, I already told you not allowed. Why are you putting the guy on the phone? He was hoping that this modern guy will convince me to do that last party. And what happened? He will go to that party, and there will be another one and another one. He will never get to the yeshiva. Because everything in life right now is a key moment. You pass the test now, right the way Hashem opens you another path. You fail, He opens you a path to the negative side. That's how it goes. It's all reflection of what you do. Mitzvah goreret mitzvah, ve'avera goreret avera. Mitzvah drag a new mitzvah right away, and a sin drag right away another sin. And when the mitzvah is huge, it drags a lot of mitzvot, not one. Because the, the way the Rambam writes, Sometimes one mitzvah can be equal like a thousand. And sometimes one sin can be equal like a thousand sin. Same time. Five minutes sin here. One thousand different sins, five minutes each. Equal on a scale to the one. Like a woman walks not modest on the street. That's already like a thousand other sins that she does. It's not the same. It's different leagues. This is one example. So Hashem comes to him all of a sudden. He changed his mind. What's going on? Now, please, please, please pay attention to what I'm about to say. This is what life is all about. Here, this is now what life is all about. Adam Molichimoto. 
A person has many paths in front of him every given moment of his life. And he's about to make the next step. Left, right, middle, reverse. Different directions, like in a supermarket. Aisle one, aisle two, aisle three. Every aisle has different surprises for you. And Hashem said to you, choose this aisle. That's the right one. Be careful from all the others. What happens if you ignore Hashem's warning or instruction? You went to the wrong aisle. You die? No. no. Nope. You walk slower? No. Your cart doesn't move? Move smoothly. You lost your money in your pocket? No. Your credit card stopped working? It works better. <laughs> Satan is happy. He increased your limit now. <laughs> Between now to the register was 10,000, now it went up to 15. Satan is so happy, delighted. He's in my pocket, this fool. I walked him in the path I want. The question is why Hashem doesn't give you a real smack and fly you to the right direction? He's your father, no? That's what a father does to his son when he goes in the wrong direction, if he's a smart father. Because Hashem made the world based on one concept and one only. We are free to do whatever we want. But in the end, He will serve us the bill. You know when you get your statement in a bank? You have credits and charges. The goal is to finish the month with more credits than charges. In the meantime, you celebrate with a credit card, you buy the real Gucci, not Chinatown. <laughs> this one, that, I heard there's a car. When I was in Miami Beach, I'm going there again for Shabbat. <laughs> I just think about this place, I'm beginning to sweat. So last time I was in Miami Beach, I was host by a very, very sweet boy. And they live in a very fancy building over there by the beach, over there in a 50th floor or something like that. You're very close to Hashem. <laughs> when I came out of the lobby, I saw maybe 30 or 40 Rolls Royce, like this. All of, only Bentley and Rolls Royce, few Ferrari, and then he showed me one special car. <laughs> Everything is special, but the, the ones are not special because every other car is Bentley there. So he showed me another sport car. I never heard this name in my life. He said, this is a car, four and a half million dollars. I took a picture of it if you want to see it. <laughs> After the lecture, it's right here. But you have to, now, somebody like me with a Yamaha, I cannot show I care about cars, standing like a fool taking pictures. <laughs> so I had to do it in a way, look around, there's all kinds of doormen opening door to go like this, you know? So the picture didn't come so clear, but that's okay. <laughs> Four and a half million dollars, what's the name of this car? Huh? Bugatti. Bugatti. Four and a half million dollar car. A guy, say, 20 something years old, drive this car. <laughs> you sell this car, 1,000 Avrechim would learn the whole year. Torah. It's the world of lies. Our person doesn't have an idea what he lives for. This is how life looks. So Hashem say to Bilam, the right thing for you to do is not to go, not to care, stay here, give up the money, and I will reward you for that. You're not doing it for free. The next time, Hashem gave him again the test to see if he's going to listen. Sometimes Hashem gives you time the test. One girl comes to you, you overcome the test. And then another one, you overcome. And the third one, you fall. No. After a few times, Hashem begins to help you more and more. He sees that you're serious. Test. A test is something that may take even years. Sometimes it's a very long process from the beginning to the end. You started it when you bar mitzvah, I will finish when you're 23. It's a very long test. So what happened now here? The second time they came, and already money is discussed, and they're willing to give him respect, it's a much higher test now. First one, you pass the test. But there was no money discussed yet, no honor, no flyers, no Facebook commercials. No, they did not make a, a law on YouTube, a special clip for you. There was no, no, and the people who came to you were nothing special. Now, the Minister of Defense came, 
this one, this one. They all came like, oh, now I'm very important. You see, it's all about honor in life. That's what they want. They want honor. Who's the one who came to me? Ah. So what happened? Now he has a bigger test. And he's failed already. He's dying to go. He should have known the answer already. Say, so why are you bothering me? I already told you I'm not coming. Get out of here. Goodbye. Don't bother me ever again. But he says, sleep, sleep here. Let's see, maybe a miracle would happen to us. <laughs> so all of a sudden, Hashem says, oh, yeah? You didn't get the message first time? No problem. Go. Now we have the big question mark here. If Hashem supposedly surrendered to his desire, evil inclination, and let him go, why he put a remark, but don't speak anything besides what I will order you to speak? That's a very, very serious contradiction. Before, he said, don't dare to go. Now you let him go, and you limit his speech. So what's the, you interfere with his free choice? So what's the point? If he's going to go and not talk, what's the point of going? It's very hard to understand Hashem here. The answer is, when does a person have complete free choice? When? when it applies to his personal life. When it applies to others, the choice is limited. The more people are under your supervision and your control, the more limited your choices are. As Chazal teaching us, Lev Melachim Veroznim Beyad Hashem. The hearts, the mind of the kings and the ministers is in the hand of Hashem. He rules what they're going to do. That's explain how someone like Ariel Sharon, that was very right-wing leader all his life, a warrior fighting against the Arab terrorists most of his life, all of a sudden, the last two, three years of his life before he went to coma, he became the most liberal left anti-Jewish leader. From all the way to the right, within months, he turned to become very, very surrendering and gave the Arabs all the lands of all the Jews and destroyed synagogue when he was willing to give his life, not to give them one inch of land all his life. All of a sudden, he became very generous. Come. Take this town, take this farm, take these buildings, take, take, take. What do you have to give? Give us, please, more rockets. Make sure you give us a lot more rockets. This is what we got for giving them all the land. You see today now every day. Nothing. We got nothing from them. Nothing. Nothing was even discussed that they have to give us anything. Just come and take a gift. Take our land. Take our buildings. Take everything. What do we want from you? Please don't kill us. What happened in reality? It became 10 times worse, because now they're much closer. So this is how, how can something like this happen? If you believe all your life in one thing, all of a sudden you became pro-terrorist, pro-Arabs? The answer is Hashem wanted us to get this punishment, and he sent him someone to give him a bribe or to warn him or something like that behind the scene. And all of a sudden he became a little puppet. This is, this is the only way to explain it. Same thing by leaders. All of a sudden, you see, when Hashem wants to make the situation worse, He sends somebody crazy, like Hitler, and look what happened. Or Gaddafi, or Assad, or all these people. When Hashem wants to boil the area, He controls everything. What do I do for my own life? I choose everything. I want to come to shul, I want to go to, to the yeshiva, I want to go to give a lecture, or I want to go to a place that I'm not supposed to be there. I choose. There is help from Hashem, of course. When Hashem sees overall that the person is in the right direction, he helps him more. When you see constantly look for negative, that's what the Gemara says. Someone who comes to purify himself, they help him from Shemaim to get purified. And someone who comes to impurify himself, they'll help him from Shemaim to become more filthy. How can they help him from Shemaim to become a bigger sinner? The answer is that's a law in nature. 
It's a law in nature, just like drugs. You start one time, grass. Tomorrow, a little bit more. A week later, all the friends come, now double than before. Double and double, then it doesn't excite you anymore. Then you go to something else, to something else, until one person came to me yesterday with tears. You should see how she was. She couldn't let me talk. I had a lot of people around me. She couldn't wait a second because she was under pressure and shaking that her nephew is in heroin. That's it, dead. Maybe one out of a hundred will get out of it. But this person that does what he does, he didn't start right away with that. He wanted to be cool, like the college kids. Ah, now why are you making a big deal out of it? The Gemara in Psachim say clearly that a Jew is not allowed to touch drugs. And Rashi writes over there, if you start doing it, it will attract you more and more and more that you cannot control yourself and you lose all your money and then you lose your life. Plus, it's a violation of V'nishmartem lenafshotechem. Yishamer lecha ushmor nafshecha me'od. There's few verses in the Torah. A person must watch his health. And it's already been proven that all drugs include light one, even the ones that they give uh, uh, cancer patients that relieve their pain, it does relieve the pain in one way, but it made other damages to the body, such as burning the brain cells. And I'm a witness that it's true what the scientists say. For one reason, when I used to teach Gemara in Yeshiva, I already knew what to expect from the student based on their past. When I saw a guy that whatever you talk to him, his brain cannot focus and cannot understand the details, cannot distinguish between one step, second step, what is a question, what is an answer, what is a silent question, what is a hidden question, you, you can't. You explain and explain and then cannot focus to move in a chair. I just come to him and say, tell me you were in India? I say yes. Because many Israelis, after the army, they, they have this brainwash that they have to go to India, because it's cheap there. Drugs is cheap. The beaches are free. Very cheap vacation. Destroyed your soul forever. Many did nev never came back from there. The drugs messed up their head. They walked naked on the street. They put them in some mental institution, or they brought them back in is to Israel, and they lay home like this with the drugs that they did over there, and they done. Thousands. Not one or two, thousands. So what happened? I said to him, you used to smoke a lot, huh? He said, yes, how do you know? So I see the damage you made to your brain. And the other secular kids who became religious who did not touch this garbage, now that they're uh, uh, Albert Einstein, not yet. But at least they have the chance to be, to be smart, to, to develop their brain. They don't have, you know, like when you do the fragments to your computer, that's a very good example. I always think about it. The computer has a lot of uh, files that were moved on the hardware to the wrong direction, so you have to put them all together. So it shows you blank spots in the brain of the computer. This is exactly what happened from these drugs. Not to talk about all the other things that later caused depression and people, uh, the high energy, and the next day, two days, they're not getting up from bed. They cannot hold any job to be a, uh, a head of, the, of a family, <laughs> you expect from him to be a father and a husband and to maintain a family. Come on, they, 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 this is what the most dangerous thing to the teenagers is these things. You can handle almost everything. Once you know a person is into that, you only need a miracle. And if the miracle won't come, his life is over. Just as it sounds, literally, no exaggeration. That's it. Once a person starts with that, that's why I tell the kids, there's one thing you're secular and you're wicked and you make sins. Hopefully you'll do tshuva. And when you do tshuva, you can become a big tzaddik. It's not late yet. But if you touch this garbage, you're done. You should know. There's certain things in life there is almost for sure no return from there. And don't look at the one who did return by a miracle. Look at the 99 who did not return until the day they died. Look at them. So, over here we learn how Hashem functions. Don't go. That's the first rule. 
but I want to go. Please, please, I want to go. Okay, go. Let's see what's going to happen. If it wasn't to curse the nation of Israel, if it was a personal sin for him, Hashem wouldn't tell him, don't talk or talk. He would let him do whatever he wants. But now, because it's affecting the life of millions, he told him, don't dare to talk. Interfere with his choice. Why? Because it's not about you. You already chose to kill yourself spiritually. But what about my children? I'll let you do uh, damage to them. They don't deserve it yet. So why should I let you succeed? So Bilan said to Balak, make seven altars, take seven cows and seven sheep and put them, sacrifice them. Maybe Hashem will come towards me and will tell me something positive, meaning negative to Israel, but for him it's positive. And he did what he told him. They did. They pre they, he made them work a lot. And what happened in the end? He began to say, Am goim lo What a verse. The Jews is a nation that will always be isolated from the rest of the world. No one would like them. No one would leave them. No one would give them rest. Nothing whatsoever. What? Am levadad ishkon. Always separate from them. Uvagoim lo itchashav. They have nothing mutual between them and the Gentiles. Different clothing, different language, different food, different religion, different manner, different everything. Different blessing. Now, what's the next sentence that Bilam say? It applies to each one of us. Each one of us. To every Jew and every non-Jew in the world. It says like this. Tamut nafshi mot yesharim v'tei achariti kamohu. We're about to finish because time is running out. I just want to highlight this. For that it was worth it for you to come. This is what he says. I wish that my death will be righteous like them. Who is speaking? The head prophet of the whole world, of the goyim. And my end will be like their end. I want to die righteous like them because I want my end to be like their end. Now, I want to ask you, I hope you're clever enough to understand what an atomic bomb I just dropped here and answer to all the ignorance and all the fools who constantly repeat the same question that always come from ignorance, of course. When people come to you and say, where does it say in the Torah that the Jews go to heaven? Where does it say in the Torah there's life after death? Why you believe the rabbis? They brainwash you. Forget about it. Eat. Come to the club. Take the drugs. Eat whatever you want. Steal. Kill. Just don't get caught by the police. <laughs> Why? Achol v'shato ki machar namut. Let's eat and let's drink and let's dance. Why? Because tomorrow we may be dead. And when you die, you die. How the secular in Israel say? Chaim pa'am achat. You live once, enjoy, grab as much as you can. Wrong, my friend, my ignorant friend. Wrong, you don't live once. We've all been here many times in different bodies, so already it's not true. And even if it was true that you only come to this world once and then you die, the question is what kind of life you will have after you die. If you watch my Life After Death film, you know what I'm talking about. Some people go to a very pleasant place for eternity, and some people go to a horrible place for eternity. Depend what you did. It will be all determined between now until the moment you die. When are you going to die? Maybe in 40 years, maybe in 50, maybe tomorrow morning, maybe now. Who knows? In Israel, any second you can die. 
You came out of your home, shh, rocket fell here. There's, today they announced on the news, all schools are closed, all weddings are canceled, no gathering of more than 100 people is allowed. Nobody can move. People are afraid. Why? You come to places, the chances that something fall, they try to aim to places where a lot of people go. So now <laughs> you have to think where to go. How many people in the wor world leave their house and walk thinking a missile will fall on my head any minute? So, Bilam answered the question to all these ignorant and to all the wicked people. What's the answer? Bilam, right here, it's right here in the Torah. He say, when I die, I want to die righteous like them. Look how modest they are. Look what connection they have with God. Look what a special nation with Torah they have. I want to die like them. When I die, pay attention. Why? That my end will be like their end. What do you mean? Who cares how you die? Who cares how you die? If you die by heart attack, or a rocket fell on your head, or somebody shot you, or you went to sleep and you didn't get up, does it make a difference? Death, it's one second, five seconds suffering. That's it. A person got a bullet, he feel pain maybe three, four seconds, is dead. That's it. The nerve system go out of commission. Doesn't feel pain. Person had a horrible accident. He crossed the street, Queens Boulevard. Boom! 300 feet in the air. In the first second, he didn't feel pain. It was less than half a second. A little bit pain, and the soul came out of the body. Nothing, he doesn't feel anything. A regular root canal, it's a hundred times harder than to die like this. <laughs> With four shots. <laughs> Jump on the chair, sweating, wow, what pain to the brain. The death itself, if it comes with torture, it's a different story. Just to die instantly, a bullet to the head, the person doesn't feel anything. It's over. It's a little sharp pain, and that's it. So who really cares how a person die? If he die like this. We only care when he died, if he die righteous, wicked, young, old. That's more or less what we care. But how he died, it's not so critical. The point now that I'm making is, what does it mean I want to have their end? This is what he's praying for. What special end the Jews have in this world? They die like everyone else. Some Jews die from cancer, some goyim die from cancer. Accident, accident. War, war. Heart attack, heart attack. Many ways to die. Whatever the goyim has, the Jews have. So what did he talk about, Bilam? What end does he talk about? The answer, the Torah already answered that. I am your God. I'm strict with you to the point that I even torture you to test you. Will you keep my laws or not? Why? Right after that, the next verse. That I should reward you in your end. When you keep my commandments all your life, I will reward you in your end. What end is talking about? When I'll be 90 like this? Huh? That's the reward? To suffer pain? To be a hunchback? To be half blind? Not to be able to hear? What does it mean, I will reward you in your end? Old people, their life become better or harder? Harder, with no exception. Even the one who kept themselves very well. You compare them now to when they were in their 20s? Cannot compare. How many old people would give 99% of their money to take another 10 years back? Is 70 or 80? Give me back to my 60. Here, 10 million dollars. No? If they come to Bill Gates now, I don't know, what is he, 60 now? Something like that? So they say, Mr. Gates, you have 70 billion dollars. 50 billion, if you give now, we bring you back to age 25. I think it would take the deal. Especially someone like him that is not greedy at all, very generous, I'll take the deal. I would take the deal, get another 30, 40 years of life for 70, 80% of your money, why not? You got the point. 
So the point is the old people do not get and never got any reward in this world. If any, the situation either stayed more or less the same or became a lot worse. Everybody understand that. So the Torah say, I will reward you in your end, means when you leave this world, the reward will begin. And if somebody say to you, okay, so Hashem will reward us in the end. But who told you the reward will be for eternity? Maybe it will be six months and that's it. Maybe it will be two years and that's it. Maybe it will be one hour and that's it. Huh? The answer is another verse in the Torah. What does it say? What does it say in the Torah? Le'ativ lecha u'levanecha ad olam. To reward you and your children for eternity. Simple Hebrew. Simple Hebrew. Go in Israel, little kid. Little kid, come, how old, how old are you? Five. Tell me, what does it mean, la'ativ lecha u'levanecha ad olam? To reward you and your children for eternity. Every fool knows it. Don't need to be a rabbi to know it. Every Israeli with the hearing here and here and here, like a camel, understand that. So why he doesn't listen to it? Because he never heard it in his life. Because he never read the Torah once in his life. He has a lot of criticism against the Torah. He never opened it in his life. You don't believe me? Next time you go to Israel, go to Tel Aviv and make a survey. Take up 100 secular Jews, guys and girls. Stop each one of them, pretend you're from television. Put channel seven, comes like this, because otherwise they won't talk to you. Make sure that you don't have a kippah, come with a hat, channel seven, CNN, something bombastic. That they want to be on television, so they give you a minute. So you come to them, excuse me, Itzik, did you, we're making a survey here. Did you read the Torah once in your life from the beginning to the end, just like you read in any other book? Just once to read the Torah, once from the beginning to the end, to know more or less what is it about? If one of the hundred will tell you yes, I'll give you a prize. How is that? Huh? Very, very, very generous offer, no? Don't count on a big prize. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a big prize. I'm very certain. And they don't know what you want from them. Now, you go to the next question. Did you read Shulchan Aruch? Yes. Excuse me? <laughs> Do you know what Shulchan Aruch means? It's a cookbook. <laughs> Shulchan, it's a table. Aruch means set. Somebody set the table. So what do, what do I look to you, like a chef? <laughs> Maybe my wife read it. <laughs> we're laughing, but we should really, really, really cry. Really, we should cry. That's the situation of our brothers and sisters. Not that we are much better. Most Jews with the yarmulke, you think they read the Torah once in their life? Only if they do shnayim ikra achat targum. They do on Friday, they read the parasha. Okay, so they did it once. But usually when people do it, unfortunately they want to finish. Da -da 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 -da, machine gun. While he's doing shnayim ikra achat targum, he read 300 emails. The emails from the whole week, he lived for the two hours, he does shnayim ikra achat targum. Then when he finished the Shnai Mikra Chat Targum and he comes out of the house, he thinks, did I do today Shnai Mikra Chat Targum? He doesn't remember. Why? His mind was somewhere else. Do you expect him to know now one sentence of what he read? He wants to finish, quick. Ay, 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 ay. So Bilam said, Tamut nafshi mot yesharim. I want to die righteous like them that my end, my eternity will be like them. I want to go to where the Jews go. And the last question for today, if you're so smart and you know the truth so much, why don't you want to live like them? You only want to die like them. But why don't you want to live like them? If you live like them, for sure, you'll die like them. When Rabbi Akiva was tortured by the Romans. They took brushes, metal brushes, and started to scratch his skin, a 120 years old, old rabbi. 
and all his body is lines of blood, lines from the brush, lines of blood, lines of blood, dripping like this. So one said, he said to him, Mara brings a story that he got caught, they put him first in prison, and there was a person named Papus. Papus warned him, so why are you teaching Torah in public? You know, you don't, you're not afraid from the Romans? Why don't you respect them? Obama said, now nah, to learn Torah, why are you learning? So Rabbi Akiva said to him, but Hashem said to learn Torah. Nothing personal against Obama or against Khomeini, but Hashem said to learn Torah. But they're going to kill us. It's war to give my life for the Torah. You're not afraid. So Rabbi Akiva said to him, you are like the fish and the fox. The fox saw the fisherman is having nets, throwing it to the water to pick up some fish. And the fish is trying to maneuver to run away from the net. So the fox is standing by the lake. He says, hey, darling, fish, I have an, a great peace offer for you. Why don't you come to the land and live with me in neighborhood? So they told him, you are the fox that they said that you're the most clever animal? Arun Kashual Chazal say. It's a very sneaky, clever animal. You are the one that they say that you're the smartest? You're the dumbest, the fish told him. If in a place that we are expert, this is our place of life, we in the water, we breathe in the water, we can live in the water, we are so afraid and so panicked that we're fighting for our life. You want to take us to a place of a certain depth? Over here, maybe we'll survive, maybe we'll die. You want us to go to the land that will die for sure? You know, when you take a fish out of the water, what's his reaction? Right away, a second later, he begins to jump. Rap music. You know the people in the club? Ah, they go like this, you know, all night. After they took a few things, they jump. <laughs> and someone that doesn't know, he come from the side, he said, wow, I never saw so many happy people here. <laughs> the next day, they shoot themselves in the head. What happened? Much yes, happened. that's what happened. So what's going on? The fish, someone who see the fish now in the hand of someone, or he put him in a basket, jump on the table, jumping, dancing. If you take two, it's a real party. So he said, look how great the fish feels when they're out of the water. Who say they need water? Look how happy they are. That's the secular Jews in this world. Lots of moving. Mondial, Samba, Brazil. On the way to Gehenom, there's a lot of dancing. But when they get there, Ovre be'emek abacha ma'ayan yeshituhu. Emek Abacha, you know what Emek Valley, you know what Bacha means? Crying. Hazal asking, what does this verse mean? People who walk in the valley of crying. He say, this is hell, Gehenom. Why they call it Emek Abacha? Because all the wicked people who danced moment before Hashem chopped them and took them out of this place for eternity, they were dancing also. Ferrari, what's the name? Bugatti. <laughs> Lots of dancing and show. Moments before, until the final silence come and the problems begin. No jokes, I'm not telling you jokes here. Reality, complete reality that can be proven scientifically already. Scientifically. Watch life after death, see. Watch it. So what happened? Chazal said there are rivers around the furnace of, of the Gehenom. Imagine now people, Lo Alenu, they took them to Auschwitz and they see the smoke coming from morning to night all day. And the Nazis made rivers around Auschwitz, rivers. Well, they asked them, why do you make rivers here? We want you to have nice view. Make sense? 
Why Hashem needs to make rivers in the furnace of the eternal Auschwitz? Why? It's not Hashem never made any river. The river was made from the tears of all the wicked people from the creation of the world until now that they non-stop screaming and crying for their sin, for not keeping Shabbat, for eating not kosher, for taking drugs, for making all kinds of giluya arayot. That's what it is. All the tears were accumulated and created river around the furnace. That's Ovre Be'emek Abacha Ma'ayan Yeshitu. Lo Alenu, that we should never be there even a minute, even a second. Bilam wants to die like a Jew. He wants to go to the heaven of the Jews, but he doesn't want to live like a Jew. Just remind me of someone who? Of us. We're not as bad as him, but we're not that much better. We all want to go to heaven, but we don't want to do anything for it. Little suffering, 30 emails a day to the rabbi. Why do I have to suffer so much? Instead of 1 million, I made only 800,000 this year. Why? Can you explain to me why Hashem is so tough with me? Why do I suffer so much? I'm 22 and I'm not married. Let's show you one minute of the life of your grandfather in Auschwitz. Then you would say, you know what, keep me in the way I am now for millions of years, you'll never hear another complaint. We put food on the table. Oh, pizza again? <laughs> We're tired of this. So what the wife say? In Auschwitz, do you think you had pizza there? But we're not in Auschwitz. They learn to answer. But we're not there. But learn from, learn from what happened around you in the world. Learn. A nation that doesn't have a past doesn't have a future. 99% of what we complain about, not war to say a word about it. Yes, there are some things that you can com complain about. I'm not saying no. But 99% of what we complain about, not only we shouldn't complain, we should actually be happy of. When you lose money, you should be happy or poor or, or complain. You should be happy. Why? Because this is the, the most lenient punishment, Hashem said. By taking money from you, it saves you much more horrible punishments later on. So if you come to the judge and he wants to send you to the electric chair, but he's willing to take $1,000 from you as redemption, when you write the $1,000 check to the court in Texas, would you be singing and dancing, or you cry over the $1,000? It would be the greatest check you ever wrote. Phew, say, wow, how lucky I am to, to lose $1,000, right? So losing money, it couldn't be get, uh, greater. Losing children, lo alenu. Horrible, no? How can you go back to life after you had such a cute boy smiling all day? How are your life going to ever be the same? Right, you have a point. But now if Hashem turned the video on on your living room and show you where the boy is with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Akiva, and he's so happy with Hashem, what would you say? Ay, why it took so long, Hashem? Why you waited 16 years until you took him to Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shimon? You couldn't take him in the day of his bar mitzvah? Everything turns to the opposite. We really cry, but think about it. Check! Don't believe me! Check on all the things you cried in the last week, one by one. Write it on a piece of paper, bring it to me, I'll prove to you that one, now one thing over there, you know if it's good or bad. You got fired from work, how do you know it's bad? Maybe in six months you're going to find a job making ten times more. I, got, I had an accident. I got fired from work in 1990. 1990. I was making $450 a week working like a complete slave. Bagels. Yeah, bagels. You, know, you can listen to my personal story. I had an accident. Three weeks I couldn't work. When I came back, they said, we'd be very sorry. We couldn't wait for you. So what happened? I went to 50 jobs like the one I had. Not one had a job for me. Yeah, give, leave your number, we'll call you. 
So I was forced to look for something new. Accidentally, I got to a place, and I made 10 times more money. So now when it happened to me, and I left with a few dollars in my pocket, and I was very desperate, and I took the train from Long Island to Penn Station and came out to the zoo of Manhattan <laughs> with seven, eight dollars in my pocket, and it's to live or to die. You know, like, you go, I go to an interview, I don't even have an idea what the job is. I only saw you want to make $1,500 a week 20-something years ago. It's like three or 4000 today. Come to this address. You're just like a complete fool. You ask me today, so what a fool will get on a train with the last few dollars he have and go to unknown place? This is a sign of desperation. So when it worked out, apparently retroactive, I just found out that the greatest thing that happened to me was getting fired. And actually something even greater happened that I had an accident. And when I broke my nose in an accident, I was laying 2 o'clock at night on the hood of my car because I flew out of the windshield and laying there like this, half dead. It was, it was like I'm thinking to myself, it's the end of the life. It uh, actually was one of the key greatest moments since I came to this country. I would not be here maybe if it didn't happen that night. And many other things. So why we always cry when we don't even know if it's a beginning of a good or a bad thing? And even when something is really bad, in the end that nothing in, in your eyes, you didn't see that anything good came out of it in this life, Wait, soon you're going to go in front of Hashem and you see from how much problems it saves you. So in the end, the words of Chazal is very, very solid and strong. Kol man de avid rachmana latav avid. Everything Hashem does, does for your own good. It may take years for you to see. Time to stop complaining. There's a few more things to say about the parasha, but the time is gone. Bezrat Hashem will see you next Monday, 8.45. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.